I mean, if the road to what El Salvador has done is done by other countries and eventually you've got a the actual world reserve currency being Bitcoin and that not only that, but also the actual currency being used by many countries, if not all of them, then yeah, it's we're talking about uh, $10 million for Bitcoin um, and uh, in the current purchasing power of today. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's just like mind boggling. It's just numbers. Hey, welcome to another episode of the Kevin Devani Connection Show. Really excited, really thrilled to have Phil Champagne on my show for the first time, the author of the book of Satoshi, the collected writing Satoshi Nakamoto. You're gonna love this talk because we went really deep down to the rabbit hole. We talked about, you know, we talked about the monetary system, about gold versus Bitcoin, about you know the central banks, uh, El Salvador. So we not only you know limited our talk, our focus on uh, his book, which is fascinating to read. Um, I can only recommend you to read it. Uh, some parts of it, to be honest with you, are a little bit technical, but it gives you a super overview, you know, all the correspondence, the emails, because not everything has been disclosed, you know, because of, you know, uh, there are some uh, reasons we're going to talk about. And uh, yeah, without further ado, um, my talk with Phil Champagne. Hope you're going to enjoy this. Let me know your questions, your comments. Make sure you follow me. You follow Phil Champagne on Twitter. Going to put everything in the show notes. And here you go. Hey, Phil. How are you yes. doing? Hi. Welcome Good to the show. show. Thank you. Hey, Phil, I'm a huge fan of yours by now. I've, I've read, to be honest with you, I haven't read, you know, the, the, all, the, you know all the parts of, of your book, of your you know, fabulous book, uh, the book of Satoshi, the collected writings of Bitcoin uh, creator Satoshi Nakamoto is the subtitle. So, Phil, you, you published this in um, 2014. Um, Okay, let's just, uh, why don't we, why don't we just start off with a little bit with your journey into the Bitcoin rabbit hole? Like, can you tell my listeners uh -huh. a little bit about your background? Uh-huh, yeah, sure. <clears throat> so in um, 2012, in summer 2012, um, the first thing is uh, my cousin came up and told me, because he knew I was a, uh, well, a guy in uh, Austrian school, loved gold investing and silver investing. And he told me about Bitcoin. And he says, it's this internet money. It was just a 30 seconds conversation over the phone. I said, what? Oh, gosh. And I just saw it as a community style money that could be inflated at will, you know? So I just dismissed this. And, I, <laughs> and then, um, uh, yeah, that's probably the reaction of so many people when you just hear the tip of the iceberg in regards to Bitcoin, you know? And uh, after that, I came across again. And shortly after, and I decided to read a little bit more and read the white paper, decided to read the white paper. And I just was impressed by what well, the quality of the white paper, how simple it was discussed. I mean, for someone with a background in computer science, at least. And uh, I was just impressed. And I was curious a little bit more about the whole story also regarding Satoshi. And so... I wanted to read a little bit more what he had to say. And what intrigued me is the fact that he had a two-year public life and then disappear. And uh, so that's why I went through and decided to read all his, his comments and everything. And I realized, actually, there's value to that. And if I'm interested, probably others will be too. And I decided then to grab up. And uh, at first, it was more like a grabbing and doing some sort of a hodgepodge kind of book and not, not, nothing complicated or elaborated, you know. And I decided after, no, actually, this really has value. And, and the fact that he's gone uh, means that, okay, it was more like almost like current event, uh, barely, you know, it was just two years, uh, well, in 2013, end of 2013, when I decided to, to do that work, somewhere in 2013. So I said, uh, yeah, this is almost like news, because he just left, you know, three years earlier, and the last post was in 2010, and I realized, okay, um, 
the more years passes, the more value will be on the historical value of what he wrote, you know. And um, also in the early beginning, how did this whole thing started and what the questions were po- were asked and everything like that. So um, that's how I came up to deciding to do a full blown book. Let me let me ask you, because you said something very interesting. You said, you you know, a lot of people, I mean, uh, even in the Bitcoin community space who, uh, you know, who are really well known, dismissed it the first time. And this is something, you know, very fundamental question, because you said something very interesting. You said, oh, you know, just, you know, maybe some kind of digital money, maybe something like that. I'm just paraphrasing you and you could yeah. probably inflate it away. And actually, you know, this is the essence of Bitcoin, the absolute scarcity. So when you yes. read the white paper, did you for the first time, like understand like, wow, this is like, absolute. It has an absolute scarcity. Did you get mm-hmm. when did you get that? Yeah, yeah. well, um, the fact that um, coming from um, Austrian school, gold, silver, which have a, some sort of a scarcity, nothing compared to Bitcoin, though. And uh, but, you know, it's just like on Bitcoin's on it's gold on steroids when it comes to scarcity. You know, it's uh, even gold you we can expect to at someday, maybe a hundred years from now, I don't know, to have gold mine on the moon or on Mars or you know, I and with robots or anything like that. So there's always going to be that that expansion for gold mining that uh, with technology. I mean, the Romans will have no idea no possibilities to mine at the five miles down the cross. I mean, the, all our ancestors, they the tip of the iceberg, the low-hanging fruits where they didn't require machineries, they didn't require all these high technologies. Now, it's very a little bit uh, uh, ironic that the same technology that bring us today the potential to dig gold deeper is also allowing us to bring up Bitcoin, which has that fixed scarcity, you know, 21 million. So it's a little bit ironic on that level. And you say something really, I mean, fundamentally important. And we were trying, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, to, to explain this to gold by, you know, it's just a matter, it's just a question of how much time, resources and technological innovation we put into the mining of gold. You know, because uh, it's, you know, it's a matter of zero to one, probably technological innovation with a, you know, it's, it's a really highly refined, sophisticated, you know, mining process, or even, you know, mm-hmm. if you go into the nuclear, subnuclear. I mean, I've heard even really from credible people. It's like, you know, it shouldn't be so difficult to reproduce gold, you know, on a whatever molecular, atomic or subnuclear level. But okay, you know, it's a topic for itself, but I, I just find it, you know, with gold and its relative or unknown scarcity, it's it's a metal, you know? I mean, I think we should put it to rest. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, um, I think there's uh, there's still value personally to own uh, physical gold and physical silver uh, for uh, being a little bit more prepared on any kind of level. I mean... For, you know, if we have uh, you know, people, for example, that were in um, on um, Puerto Rico when there was the, uh, the hurricane that came up, uh, that uh, pretty much took, up, took um, the grid off. And so they had those who had paper cash were able to imagine the conditions where we actually are in a very high inflationary rate. Uh, where paper cash is not something valuable, and so for long, you know, and it's just every every year, every day, you've got fifty percent increase in prices. For example, that's hyperinflation crazy. You've got something like this for whatever in the world, and then gold and silver is the really the you know the artifact. Until we have something where we could have Bitcoin. Uh, that is uh, strong in terms of a physical content, because typically that's the uh, that's a big thing. Bitcoin is natural; it's an environment. It's a pure, um, it's is way of uh, existing is in the digital world, yeah. while it requires a derivatives in the physical world. While gold and silver is just the opposite. You know, they require a derivatives when you're talking about the electronic world. 
And um, so this completely um, perpendicular, uh, they're orthogonal in terms of, uh, of, um, of nature. So that is the benefit, I think, is to, um, to own gold and silver on that level. But um, obviously, <clears throat> if uh, one day we have a way to mitigate or even eliminate uh, the uh, third party requirements or derivative aspect of Bitcoin in physical nature, it will be amazing. Maybe it's going to come. I mean, we're always surprised with technological event advancement. Just 12 years ago, um, 13 years ago, we never thought that uh, something like a cryptocurrency could exist with a limited supply and nobody controls it. And now we have Bitcoin. And uh, so to imagine that we'll never have a, uh, a true forms in the physical world or in some way, I, I, maybe we will. You know? So it'll be yeah. quite impressive when we reach that level as well. It just, you know, I mean, I think Max Kaiser even uh, um, emphasized this fact that if you just, you know, measure the, like the, the like you've got Bitcoin, the increasing or actually exponentially increasing purchasing power. I mean, you've got volatility, but you've got increasing purchasing power in a long term. But with, uh, uh, you know, yeah. fiat or gold, you have, yeah, you might have like a moderate, like a, a sort of a stability, mm -hmm. but... Mm -hmm. It's like what I mean. If you like, you know, extrapolate this over longer time frame, it's what is it like? Uh, maybe one percent, two percent above the inflation rate. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's the um, that's the thing. I mean, I think uh, that it's when we say when the Federal Reserve talks about a two percent, it's completely wrong. We know it's way more, and there is more like five, six percent. But let's fudge numbers to make it look like it's two percent yeah all right congratulations you you fool the people but um truly with goal and has been two percent and it allowed people at the time they did not have to speculate and you know you just save everybody just could save their cash and pile up and they don't have to rush into putting it to work somewhere and speculate something into a socks or something which they had to since 1913 with the U.S. dollar, they had to speculate. They're forced to. Otherwise, if they, I mean, someone will only pile up dollars since, uh, I mean, they'll, they'll be constantly having to uh, lose. They'll, they'll lose more than they actually save, you know, at some point, unless they really save a lot. And even that, you know. So it's, it's really uh, a steal, uh, a form of theft and uh, inflation tax and so that's critical to i think what's the benefit of bitcoin is on top of that if you've got a say we're in the year 2140 there's a zero bitcoin anymore being inflated you know all bitcoins have been created now we're actually on a slight deflationary event you know it's like as people lose their bitcoin here and there and so now it's actually you're gaining uh slightly per year by saving now, some people ask and the um, Keynesians, they believe that that's going to be the end of the world, we're going to die. I mean, if people like in, uh, in Zimbabwe or Turkey right now can survive and thrive still you know, in an inflationary environment, uh, then a slight deflationary will just be fine too. I mean, even better, you know. So that's the, uh, the thing that all these... Um, views have been so much distorted for decades that there yeah. has to be yeah. uh, it's been experts really that are made, fake experts made a wrong. science out of it i mean the whole kenny yeah. you know, it's like yeah. i think it was, it was <laughs> and Amuz in his book or you know in his talks where he you know called it like voodoo science or you know where they you uh -huh. know they complicate things uh, and try to do them aggregate calculations i don't know what they're doing but uh it's it's um uh, you Mathematics know. is their only tool to fool. I mean, a very complex equation, very complex phrasings, and uh, 
apparently uh, Ben Bernanke's book. He wrote some books, and they're extremely complicated to read. You know, you're you're not sure what you're reading. You know, <laughs> it's like that's their only way. You know, to make it look so exactly. complex. Yeah. So how there only PhDs in economics could understand. So we better leave that to them, and uh, just so we're gonna live like the usual and be suffering whatever. Yeah. From whatever they exactly. decide. It's so their yeah, only way that through Bitcoin or through the teachings of Austrian economics, you know, we, uh, people understand, you know, the what do you call it? This, the um, praxeology, like the study of human action and the effects of human action and that you cannot foresee, predict, you know, everything because it's all dynamic. Right. I mean, probably you can, mm -hmm. you know, explain this much, much better uh, uh, way. Yeah, you mean the dynamic aspect of uh, for uh, the pricing and everything? I'm yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. Yeah, well, that, that's the thing. I mean, the there's no way that the central planners, I mean, um, actually, somebody told me, my cousin, uh, was telling me that USSR had to look up the price, uh, the pricing on the West for things to have an idea what price it should apply to, you know, toothpaste or pick a, or carrots or pick a thing, you know, okay, what, what should we charge for those things? You know, there's no market. So they look at what, are, what they're char charging in Germany and France and US. Oh, okay. That's the price for milk. All right. So we'll charge that for milk. You know? Oh my God. Yeah. That's, uh, that's that's, that is how ridiculous it is yeah. when you're there's no way because it's the sum of everybody's individual and there's no way for you to find out. Okay, Bob on uh, road number one, he doesn't want to, to drink much milk this week or this year, you know, oh, or this next week he wants to do a big cake for his daughter, you know, and then he wants to buy a bunch of eggs and a bunch of milk. So there's just no way to, uh, you know, when you sum up everybody's uh, desire. There's just no way that any central planners can figure that out, but they tend to make you believe they can. And it's just amazing. <laughs> so Phil, before we talk about your, you know, beautiful book, uh, by the way, I love your book cover. Um, not sure we can okay. Read. Yeah, yeah, it's really, <laughs> uh, it was really, um, yeah, it was really mind blowing reading your book because um, it, it goes through the thought, thought process of, of Satoshi and of course, you know, all the other who, who, whom we had correspondence with. Now, let me ask you, uh, before we go into talk about your book, let me ask you first, what do you think about this whole, you know, uh, story, this, this, this uh, unbelievable story about, you know, about El Salvador making Bitcoin uh -huh. legal tender? Yeah. <laughs> I know your take. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, well, it's uh, it's interesting, yeah, because uh, there's multiple angles to that story, yeah. Um, so, uh, forcing people to merchants to accept Bitcoin, you know, and sell bit invasive. However, they're giving them the options if they're they do not have the technology. So it's somewhat uh, mitigated by that. So it's not like a full blown. Um, stamp on their foot the, here you must accept this thing but um, overall uh, it's beneficial and, and I'm really curious obviously the countries a country the first country that is doing this it's not surprising that they don't have their own currency national currency you know they're using US dollars so you might see Panama doing the same thing at some point for example which they too are using US dollar um, but uh, it's surprising that uh, otherwise it will be surprising. But uh, I think uh, Paraguay is thinking we're doing the same. Exactly. Paraguay, Mexico, but, maybe. Uh, there are some, I think I'm hoping, you know, that more and more smaller countries or smaller, smaller yeah. countries start uh -huh. adopting it or, or you know, implement <clears throat> it. They, the, the, the thing that it implies is that maybe eventually we'll start seeing contracts written in Bitcoin. Because in the one, I mean, one of the reasons why it's so volatile uh, is because uh, no contracts are written in Bitcoin. No, there's no, no, nothing is tied to it. You know, so it's purely like a commodity. It's like oil or something like that. And um, now if, um, if we had uh, contracts and mostly more important, uh, a big, a big country, a relatively big size country, if contracts were written in it, then you would have a implied attachment to uh, the living cost of living to that region. 
And uh, so that will be, at least for these individuals, more stability in, in terms of what's going on. Now, um, that that's still uh, something to, to see how these small countries, but it is really opening a door. I was not expecting this to see this such early. But um, considering that we're having uh, the start of very high inflation uh, here, just in the U.S., you know, uh, we're seeing this, and uh, it's intriguing at the moment that uh, this is starting to kick up. What are, what are the countries going to follow? The implications could be. Uh, I think it's a very nice ex experiment to see because now it can demonstrate. Look. Uh, you know, they're not dying or, you know, they're actually a lot of people that are gravitating towards Bitcoin as a currency and moving away and within El Salvador and where you might see more and more like uh, contract contractual agreement. You know, obviously there's um, still fluctuation that happens uh, with the currency overall compared to um, um, to the overall market. I mean, um, so we'll see uh, because, you know, the U.S. dollar uh, is still the world reserve currency and all the commodities are traded on U.S. dollars. So it has this artificial stability because of that. But once the U.S. dollar is no longer used as world reserve currency, I think Bitcoin will become the uh, um, prevalent, much more attractive aspect of uh, as, uh, and as another method of pricing commodities in the world and countries like El Salvador will suddenly be beneficial to that in terms of more stability. Which could happen, you know, much faster maybe than expected. I mean, look at Russia, yes. I think they sold the last reserves, dollar reserves and yeah. Iran circumventing, you know, uh, yeah. the, the, the sanctions, the embargoes. Uh, it's, yeah. it's mind boggling at the speed, the rate of speed that, you know, which mm -hmm. the process is taking mm -hmm. place. I mean, yeah. look at, uh, and that's what I was also, also going to ask you because, you know, there was a beautiful article uh, by Dylan today, uh, which I can send you later on um, in his newsletter uh -huh. about George Soros, sort of his speculative, like Michael Saylor, you know, doing the speculative attack on the dollar. Uh -huh. He's doing it, I think he's like, it's a deja vu, like, you know, when he shorted uh, the pound, the British pound, you know, George Soros, I think, when was yeah. that, like? Uh, 92 or really is that so, so long ago okay yeah, yeah in the 90s he made like a billion dollar profit by 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 you know doing a speculative t attack on the british pound and so he's doing it now with bitcoin against the dollar now i mean um you're, you're talking about, did you say george soros is doing uh or you're talking with somebody uh yeah george soros yeah i mean he's actually he's doing, doing it like in a scaled version what michael saylor is doing He's, buying, he's investing in Bitcoin. Yeah. It's just announced so, so. yesterday or today. Okay. I, I missed that. Okay. Yeah, I'm okay. going to send you the article. It's really... Okay. Uh, oh, it's happy. announced today. Okay. It's early morning here. That's why yeah. That's it. yeah. <laughs> so things are real. Oh, yeah, that's interesting. Oh. But, you know, just my opinion. Uh, yeah, I don't think they like overall, but uh, I think they're realizing that uh, it's... Things are going that way, and so now it's best for them to try to uh, to swing it their way or to control it as much as they can in some way or whatever. Because in my pers perspective, is that Soros um, had some very good prior insider information regarding the British pound uh, short in the British pound. Um, <clears throat> they're all connected. I mean, they can. All those cryptocurrency, uh, sorry, those government currencies trading each other, they can make backdoor deals, the central banks between each other easily. And they do that all the time. So that this control devaluation of UK dollars is like, okay, we're going to make it crash, but in, you're going to work for us in other ways. You know, it's just a bunch of um, a group of a cartel basically working together. So the fact that he's investing in uh, Bitcoin uh, makes you give an idea. Okay, yeah, it's uh, they're accumulating, they're benefiting this dip, and uh, they're um, trying to um, keep this dip, you know, fluctuating in the zone so they can accumulate even more until it goes into the stratosphere. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, we're going to see how it's going to play out. So let's talk about your book, uh, Phil. Uh -huh. um, yeah. One principal question, because 
uh, what I find fascinating, you've really collected like, um, or you've uh, retrieved like documents, like correspondence, emails from all kinds of people, even, you know, Gavin Anderson, or, you know, all these people that used to work, you know, mm -hmm. in that field. Uh, because I know Dominic Frisbee also wrote a book, you know, on 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 this whole communication and the and the documents and the emails. So, um, the, did you have? I mean, you, there's still there's a lot of correspondence or emails or documents which are not which have not been published or not not have or they haven't been made you know public or Correct. not disclosed. Yes. Do you think? Um, do you think there's a reason to that? You know, in, uh, is it because you know it would it would compromise maybe the identity of Satoshi Nakamoto or? Uh, <clears throat> what no, the, I don't think so. Uh, I think, uh, for example, Gavin told me that um, he had more than uh, just the emails he shared with me, and that's the email he decided to share uh, with uh, with the journalist and myself. Uh, but everything else, he keeps uh, be simply because he doesn't want to share correspondence that he had with a third party with uh, the permission from the third parties and so you can't talk to that third party and that, so it's on that principle that he decided not to share but i i doubt that uh um based on everything we've saw so much satoshi never reveal reveal anything about himself uh or it was only technical matters that was discussed so i believe that whoever whatever discussion there is out there uh, that is not being seen by any by the public is still of a technical nature. Okay, no. got you. Okay, um, so Phil, what is I mean? Are there any um, like the the way he Satoshi Nakamoto designed Bitcoin um, and laid out you know uh, everything? First of all, let's let's start you know with <laughs> this. Uh, with this thing, uh, with uh, what he sort of time stamped into the blockchain, you know, uh, January the third. Uh, when was that? Uh -huh. Two thousand nine. Yeah. Uh, Chancellor on the brink of second bailout. Mm. What do you think? I mean, after reading through all these, you know, sources and materials, what do you think was the, you know, uh, the motive or, or the, you know, the the purpose, like to to sort of to to get rid of all these privileges or also, or, or um, did you also talk about, you know, inflation, hype inflation, the, maybe even the cartel structure. Is there anything you found that, that baffled you? Um, so the, <clears throat> the, um, the purpose of this, uh, I, I, I realized that after writing the, the book, the purpose of the, um, of these, um, Chancellor, you know, this uh, footprint in the Jesus block is to prove to anyone that <clears throat> this was based on the headlines of the newspaper that day. So it was not pre mine. Although, I mean, it wouldn't have not, not mattered that much because um, nobody was mining much. Uh, but it was really a proof, an added proof that uh, we're really fair here. It's not, it's not being started before. So we're not like uh, already have created those fake blockchains before that with a fake time stance that are in the future so that we can zap up those things and win. Because actually, you know, he was the only one. But uh, you had to uh, mark it with an event of that day so that you prove that uh, it was not done before. And the second thing is uh, he picked that sp this specific uh, statement on that day. I mean, it's just remarkable that we had such a such a headline that day, and that happens to be the day that he decided to. And uh, it's just remarkable. It's just like in your face, you know. A sub subtle thing is you won't be able to do that with Bitcoin. You know, bailouts, no. You know, it's like uh, socialized, uh, privatized the gain and socialized the loss is, uh, is gone with Bitcoin. You know, everybody's on the same same ride. You know, it's uh, only the, the, the ones who are, can um, afford to, to stay will stay. And those who make mistakes will have to pay and be penalized for those by the market. And that's what should be. I mean... They're the structure of always, you know, oh, we're going to bail out those, those banks, otherwise uh, things will fall apart. Well, you know, uh, you're just kicking the can down the road. That's what they did in 2008. Now, they have not fixed anything at all. 
the system is sick by design. Uh, the fractional reserve banking on a central bank paper currency is meant to be eventually a, a complete unstable system that eventually will completely crash down. Now it's just a matter of time. But uh, 2008 was really like the the pre earthquake, you know, the the earthquake before the uh, the volcano explodes, you know. And um, um, this decade is definitely the end uh, and it happens to be this in, i mean people thought that it will be in the prior decade in the 2010s but uh they managed with uh, a lot of management of um, perceptions and expectations you know it's mostly a, a game of influencing the public to to keep their um their confidence in the central banking and everything like that and they were extremely well first into all the techniques to do that. And that's what allowed them to push that down to this today, you know, 2021. And, but this decade, uh, I cannot see how they could push it up more than, you know, the next two, three, four or five years, you know, we're really close to things are starting. And that's going to be with the inflation coming in, we're probably going to see, uh, you know, a lot of people struggling and uh, getting into debt in some way, <clears throat> and which might, I'm not sure how they're going to react. It's the, ta- the fact that it's a political money. You know, the central bank decide, just like in 2019, and 1929, sorry, they decided when the crash will happen. You know, if the central bank decide that the, 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 the banks have to, call the margin calls because of the overnight lending and all these regulations behind the scene, then they know it's just going to start the ball rolling down the deflationary deflationary ball. Uh, If we go in that route again, it's going to be monstrous in the beginning and they'll then push the pedal and print like crazy and then that will be opening to hyperinflation. That's either that or they keep pushing and preventing any kind of major correction, in which case at some point we're going to be uh, and I kick in the hyperinflation in some way. There's some ways, some, at some point it'll be uh, the, the trigger that is going to happen, but you, there's no way to know exactly the, uh, the, the big trigger, but so, seeing in the price of oil right now at $75 and uh these are really making uh, everything else going to go up in price. And uh, it's uh, going to be uh, like in the 70s you know, on steroids, maybe. And then we're going to see hyperinflation. It's, uh, I mean, we would have had hyperinflation in the late 70s if they had not raised interest rates all the way to double digit. But they can't afford that right now. They just, no, they can't. No, they, I think they trapped yeah. themselves. They can't. They yeah. have to inflate it away. Yeah. Thing. That's the only governments are too much yeah. in debt. Yeah, yeah there's too much derivatives. And yeah. I mean, just uh, just look at the unfunded liabilities. I mean, the global debt is officially like 250, 270 trillion dollars globally. And then with all the unfunded liabilities, yeah. I mean, you get a like a crazy number of two quadrillion US dollars. Uh huh. Yeah. When you count everything and derivatives and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there's a very good um, article I posted on. Um, I'll, I'll share it to you uh, from uh, Bill Alter from uh, Jim Sinclair. Minds- I mean, Jim, Jim um, um, uh, mind- Mindset as uh, Mind, M I N E S E T. Um, and it's really uh, a well verse. I mean, it's very well done, this article, because it talks about, you know, derivatives works. Uh, as long as they don't have to perform, you know, when because the amount of oh, money they have that. to cover. Oh, I, I retweeted your article actually today. That's oh, you, you read it. I okay, quoted good, good. it actually, yeah, because it was so really like a short article, really well written. Yes. It, it went yeah. right to the essence of what yes. derivatives are and, you know, the whole implosive yeah. or explosive nature of derivatives. Yeah, yeah. And w- imagine in an environment like that where we have this kind of what will happen to gold, silver, and Bitcoin? Bitcoin, you might wake up in the morning and you say, wait, 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 there's zero extra here on the price. What's going on? I mean, 
it's just again a factor of 10 in a day or uh, uh, i need my coffee i can't read right you know it'll be something of that nature that might happen because exactly. it's going to be so much a shock and so much a uh we don't know how things will but yeah it's not good for the dollar and I think that that day when that day comes, I think finally people are going to wake up and, uh, you know, s stop thinking or measuring Bitcoin in fiat denominated, because then you need you are forced like, to think in purchasing power, because mm -hmm. this is where, you know, I mean, yeah. of course, you know, Bitcoin can go to you know, a million, 10 million. But what does it really mean in terms of purchasing power? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's where El Salvador <laughs> will have everybody else uh, just looking at the Bitcoin price when they are buying something and uh, forgetting the other thing uh, with dollar thing. Uh, no, I just want to focus on the on the Bitcoin part. And merchants will say, you know, we uh, really prefer you pay in Bitcoin. <laughs> Otherwise, they'll have to do the opposite. You know, many merchants, they convert their Bitcoin to dollars. Now it'll be the opposite. You know, so I will convert my dollars to Bitcoin whenever people decide to pay me in, in dollars rather than yeah. Bitcoin. So you, be, uh, uh, let's go yeah. back to your book, um, because, uh, you know, like in when you listen to talks of Andreas Antonopoulos or other well-known, you know, Bitcoin teachers or, you know, um, they say that, you know, in the very first, like early phase of Bitcoin, like in the early years, they could have, they, you know, whatever the central bank, the governmental structure, they could have attacked Bitcoin. They could have like nipped it in the bud or, you know, made it obsolete sort of, you know, but, mm -hmm. but then the cat was out of the bag years later. Mm -hmm. So did you read something? I mean, I don't, you know, was there like some, some emails or correspondence he, uh, of Satoshi Nakamoto where he was sort of concerned, like, you know, uh, and, and maybe maybe you tie this into Wikipedia. You know when for, you know when he first was really yeah, concerned, yeah. like oh you know uh, I don't know what what was the phrase you know that like the yeah. uh, he's concerned the uh, it's gonna hit the uh, ornest nest. Uh, yeah. Like that. yeah. Uh, that's the the closest there is in terms of um, when where Satoshi is involved and in reference to um, <clears throat> he was like uh, not. Not sure he wanted that limelight in the beginning at that time, at that stage. It's like he still saw that as something that needed to be improved and so on. Um, but um, <clears throat> yeah, I think the, uh, the CEO, the form, former CEO of Overstock, uh, Patrick Byrne, uh, he, he had uh, his take was similar to that. Basically, uh, they did, did not consider it much. You know, when you think like the Keynesians, you believe that this thing is not going to be well. There's nobody supporting it. It's uh, it doesn't have any utility. You just look at uh, what Krugman has to say, Paul Krugman. Uh, no, that's the kind of thinking they said. There's no way it's going to go to zero because you know there's no utility to it. No, well, whatever. They're they're looking at it, and so I think there's a possibility that exactly how they saw it. Very nice experiment. It's just that little crowd is having fun in the net in the first few years, but uh, it's not going to take off. And then slowly it's taking off, but then there's always too many people. They'll just look silly if they start to. Uh, and right now it's obvious that it's just too late. I mean, China can do that because, well, China is China with their, I mean, there's no liberty over there. So, I mean, uh, so. They it's, mean, it's already obvious to everyone, right now. Yeah. but they want to, yeah, the West still wants, the government still wants to maintain that illusion of freedom. Uh, so uh, they are only going on against freedom whenever the public is amenable to it, like, just like the COVID lockdowns, for example. You know, there's the extreme levels they've done in some countries. Uh, now, they knew that they would, they could get it through fear. But uh, how can you induce fear with re in regards to Bitcoin? You know, it's just like another currency, you know, so it's what could be feared about, you know, how could it destroy the economy? <laughs> Is the dollar so weak that you're afraid of this thing called Bitcoin? <laughs> so I don't think they, uh, I think it's, yeah, it's too late. It's definitely, definitely. Yeah, these mainstream economists such as Paul Krugman, whoever these people are, Nuriel, Nuriel Rubini. I mean, how many, how yeah. many times did they make like really, fatally you know stupid 
predictions uh-huh. about the, the facts, yeah. the internet, you know, <laughs> they don't yeah. understand yeah, yeah. the power of network effect, of exponential network effects, of adoption of, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And the same thing is funny is that certain gold bugs, you know, they can uh, Bitcoin, just like Peter Schiff. And it's just remarkable to see all the arguments. What what might find funny is that so many times I see something a tweet that he that Peter Schiff will say, in total criticizing total Bitcoin in total on a topic. His son, did you read the comments or the tweets of it? Because his son is like a total Bitcoiner. Yeah, 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 yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. Like my yeah. But then the arguments sometimes that he goes and mention about against Bitcoin are arguments that well, you know what, son. Someone could say that about gold too. You know, it's like uh, it was ridiculous that that argument was silly, but uh, I could hear Paul Krugman say that about gold. <laughs> so, so it's just hilarious that he was spinning out anything he could throw in uh, any kind of mud yeah. he could get at Bitcoin. It's not even he's not even thinking clearly, and uh, you know the bias is so strong that he's not even realizing those things. I think it's very important to be. Um, watching our own bias and yeah. investment can make you bias once you get into one thing uh, and uh, you take a position and and on that's, top of that I mean you've got it, you know it's a financial economical it's, you know, incentives and and dependence that I mean, you subconsciously know. unconsciously yeah. unconsciously exactly. uh, affect your uh, your bias yeah yeah <laughs> your views so Phil <laughs> tell me like is there something like during your research, is there something that really surprised you, like really shocked you or something that really stands out in during your research? Um, well, more like uh, what is funny and mostly in Insight today is that so many things that has been discussed in the first two years are topics that are still brought up today, you know. And there's constantly, you know, and the the aspect of um, you know, the fifty one percent attack or um, the uh, to gold or uh, the Bitcoin mining waste resource, you know, in chapter fifty five, you know, and there's a blob about it, you know, it's over and over. And all those things have been touched, and so it's just funny to see. Okay, here's what uh, what was at stake, you know. And what I really found uh, very amusing is um, what um, Satoshi said about the comparison of gold. Uh, boring gray, uh, page two eighty two, uh, two eighty two, two eighty two. Yeah. So it's like. Um, he says, uh, as a thought experiment, imagine there was a base metal as scarce as gold, but with the following properties. Boring grain color, not a good conductor of electricity, not a particularly strong, but not ductile uh, or easily malleable, either not useful for any practical or ornamental purpose. And one special magical property can be transported over a communication channel. And uh, that's pretty much sums it up. I mean, in terms of yeah, in turn, it will, if we if it was a metal, you know, uh, oh well, it's just as coarse as gold, but its property is nothing that can be used for jewelry or anything. It's just for transporting over medium something that gold and silver cannot and will not do. I mean, unless unless we got Star Trek and uh, teletransportation, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's yeah. really the it's it's the most pristine thing that has been ever been created or whatever you know discovered or yeah. Uh, yeah. in human history, monetary you know evolution, and you know and the the you know Bitcoin with its absolute scarcity and it's uh, as, as I think it's called sort of ma- it's called the magic sauce is is the difficulty adjustment you know and the proof uh-huh. of work I mean all these like. Yeah. You know properties yeah. or, or 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 mechanisms uh, of, of Bitcoin, which is set in stone. You know, mm-hmm. it makes it really totally unique. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And, and I saw that uh, someone asked a question on uh, on Twitter. Yeah. Uh, regarding the uh, the block halving. You know, yeah. uh, why is the scheduling every four years? And I I wish I I wish I had an answer. 
I mean, the only thing I can think of is we have to put our perspective at, uh, I mean, he was, he's not God. You know, uh, yeah. even when there was a bug in the, in the software and uh, in a couple of things that he realized that could be modified later on. And um, so the, there's a possibility that he was just looking at, OK, I wanted something that is uh, simple to understand. And so 50 and constant 50 uh, Bitcoin per block in the beginning. And but we want to get to zero uh, in the year 2140. So, well, uh, we'll. We'll do the halving, you know, without thinking about the consequence of that. And obviously, the consequence is the price action. It brings up a huge uh, move up of pushing price that jumps up. I mean, we're in got an induced volatility because of that. You know, just imagine if gold output in the world of gold mining output was being cut in half next year, for example. What would happen what to James the price Lop, of gold? Uh, James Lop commented on that question. Do you know James Lop? You know, the yeah. one of the, yeah, so he, he actually- yeah, Yes, yeah, I know, I've met him. Uh, I mean, he said, you know, that he wanted to, uh, yeah, sort of uh, Satoshi Nakamoto, allegedly, I mean, I'm not sure. He said that Satoshi said it mimics the gold emission curve. Is that, I mean, can you verify that? Yeah, or? I. No, I, 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 I don't remember this, this, this thing. Uh, so it's more like uh, just Jimison would need to uh, elaborate on that. I, um, I don't recall uh, this conversation. Yeah, maybe we can uh, ask him like where, where yeah. did he get his get his information from? Yeah. It has to be some kind of email or. Well, I mean, because uh, yeah, I'm not sure in what way because there's nothing in gold that uh, where you've got a. A uh, halving like that, you know, uh, halving of the uh, yeah. it's uh, the, a drop by fifty percent as uh, in the mining output is not something that happens in gold. Um, so I'm not sure uh, what you meant. Yeah, yeah, because I mean, you know, if you want to, and, like, and the choice, of, yeah, the choice of four gold, years is also interesting. Yeah. Huh? I'm sorry. No, I just want to say, you know, I mean, there's gold. How much gold is there? Like in total, like 200,000 tons. And every year, I think there's additional like 3000 tons. So so there, there's an inflation of approximately two to two, three percent or something like that. Yeah. 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 Somewhere in the two percent range. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, the, the impact will be quite uh, impressive on the stability of the price of gold if every four years uh, somehow the mining output will be dropped by uh, by half. Uh, yeah. That will be itself. So we have this induced volatility uh, that comes up, but I think it's going to be not as much as important as we go, mm -hmm. uh, simply because uh, the inflation rate will be getting so low and so low. I mean, it obviously... It fits also with the you know, beginning with so many few people in 2012, the first ha halving, that uh, it did not have a, uh, uh, an impact as much initially, but it, it did in pricing. But uh, because, you know, there's so much. Uh, so obviously uh, an impact like this from 50 to 25, you know, and, and then the inflation drop was you now for... I can't remember what, 40% to 20%. Uh, I, I'm picking up those numbers. I don't remember what it was back then. But the population, you know, the the requirements for absorbing it to population when there was so few in the beginning that were in it. So there was somewhat in, induced with that. But in the future, uh, when it's very stabilized, used everywhere, and then there's, it's probably not going to be eventually as important that's the speculation again from me, but we'll see. Uh, but until then, we we, we have those huge uh, and well, what yeah. can you say? <laughs> yeah, and I think we, we I think it's really important to emphasize, you know, to, to, to our listeners. I mean, why Bitcoin again is so so unique uh, compared to other, you know, as you 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 mentioned commodities or whatever that is. If there's a higher demand, when demand rises, usually there's you know more effort, more more time and energy put into the the mining, the production uh -huh. of you yeah. Know, and you can't yeah, yeah. do that with Bitcoin. Actually, yes. Bitcoin gives you supply shocks every four years. You know? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. This makes it so unique. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It is. Uh, yeah. It's it's a protocol base. Uh, 
emission and rather than uh, than uh, market base. And yes. so it is really in a big difference, you know. And um, yeah, um, but you know, it's. I think it's more like for metals. It's more like the opposite. I think. Um, like I uh, went to uh, discuss that in the beginning. If uh, we've got robots suddenly, the technology for robots to explore, then we'll have a shock. I mean, just like the Spanish when they discovered um, the Americas, and suddenly there was a supply shock of uh, on the positive side, you know, on the more supply of gold and silver, and which uh, affected greatly Spain's to its benefit, but. Um, I also uh, made it a little bit like uh, U.S. in terms of uh, in the uh, in the 20, 1980s, uh, 1990s, and 2000. Considering that suddenly they were more like an exporters uh, in, of gold and silver and importers of goods, and uh, because there was a deficit, but they had uh, they had plenty of gold to supply that deficit back then, Spain. While the U.S. is uh, it's, it's what they are doing with the world reserve currency, which is an artificial, an artificial, uh, completely artificial. At least, at least still Spain adds actual gold and silver to offer in exchange. Um, so the, the fact that uh, we might have gold mining on the moon uh, will be a similar impact at some point, you know. Yeah, that suddenly uh, yeah. have have a jump up and not uh, down in the in the supply. Yeah, I mean, if we take the status quo of gold, you know, I mean, it's an open secret that the price of gold has been and is being you know manipulated constantly, and there is like I don't know by order of magnitude so much more paper gold, you know, sort of. Oh the, yeah, yes. I mean, than, that's the beauty yeah. of it, and uh, from a trader's perspective, I'll tell you, you know, it's like. It's when it's mathematically uh, they are on the price, uh, gold and silver, and even more silver than gold. So uh, when you are not sure about uh, Bitcoin uh, in the, the next X years, uh, definitely Bitcoin is going to benefit from a, uh, a reset of, towards a more sound money. Uh, Bitcoin will benefit in that. But uh, gold and silver will have their reverse bubble because there it's a reverse bubble. You know, everything is a bubble except gold and silver, where it's actually uh, it's a bubble of short contracts. You know, and there's too many short contracts, a hundred shares, two hundred shares for uh, no, sorry, two hundred players for one chair, musical chair. So it's going to be uh, quite a show when. Uh, for price discoveries when uh, when reality sets in and uh, yeah yeah it's going to be a shock that's that's mind boggling so what do you think is realistic for gold i mean some people some gold experts i don't know yeah uh, well okay it's so from the gold bugs perspective the guy like bill holter that uh, wrote that article um the perspective is that um if if uh the us government was to back again, uh, reset um, the value of gold based on the current amount of debt. Uh, the, the napkin calculation of that will give you something, and that's assuming that whatever they have in Fort Knox is owned by the government, U.S. government, not being lended out, or it's not empty. Fort Knox is not an empty You don't shed, think it's you know? empty? You don't think it's... Uh, it might, it might actually, yeah, because what was the last audit? At least whatever is in it, uh, is in that, is not what the, what they say. It's less, very likely less. Otherwise, they will say, yeah, sure, audit it every year if you want. But the fact the, the last one was 1953. And um, so, but if, the numbers are accurate, then it'll be more like somewhere close to eighty thousand dollars per gold okay. or per ounce of gold or a hundred thousand. Now imagine what that means for right now. If Bitcoin was matching the total the market cap of Bitcoin was matching that of market cap of coal, Bitcoin price will be around four hundred thousand yeah. uh, dollars uh, per Bitcoin, somewhere around that. Now, if you Put a factor of five, uh, fifty on the price of gold. 
uh, then, uh, you know, we're talking a multi-million dollars per Bitcoin. Uh, you know, uh, Especially yeah, if you consider the, the total addressable market of, I mean, I talked to Greg Force, he said the real total addressable market is around $950 trillion. So let's just say even, let's just, you know, because some people, uh, you know, uh, mention like $400, $500 trillion. So if mm -hmm. yeah. so it has a potential like to whatever yeah 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 so yeah it depends on how you uh if you if you say that uh bitcoin replaced the dollar and there's well right now there's a a, a quadrillion quadrillion dollars of uh of uh, dollars to be replaced with something else uh yeah that's the way to go if uh if uh, you want to imagine uh it this way and which i mean if the road to what El Salvador has done is done by other countries, and eventually you've got a the actual world reserve currency being Bitcoin, and that not only that, but also the actual currency being used by many countries, if not all of them. Then, yeah, it's we're talking about uh, ten million dollars for Bitcoin, and um, and uh, in the current purchasing power of today. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's just like mind-boggling. It's just numbers that are difficult. But just remember, people are talking about $10,000 per Bitcoin or $100,000 per Bitcoin back in 2013, uh -huh. 12, 13, 14. And everybody mentioned those things like, gosh, wow, that'll be quite a scene to see yeah. Bitcoin at $10,000. <laughs> And uh, the but yeah, there's potential to do yeah. that. Yeah, the human it's, brain. It's just a matter of perspective. Once you reach that, then you're looking, you know, beyond it in the next row, next hill. You know, you reach the top of the hill, then you see the other hills, and then uh, you get to the next one after that, and then you have a different perspective once you reach that new uh, yeah. top of the hill. And I think, you know, the human brain has a real difficulty understanding exponential and, and ex especially exponential network effects. You know, we are like at, the, at this point of time, I think we are, we can yeah. compare it to the internet or you know, 1997. <laughs> it's like, yeah. it went like on a vertical curvature, uh, you yeah. know, reach like, you know, a billion users by, or, you know, adopters, Bitcoin adopters mm -hmm. by two, 2024, 25, maybe, realistically, yeah. even speaking, you know? Yeah. 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 It's, uh Nonlinear system and logarithmic systems are completely too much abstract for us to extrapolate anything. And that's one of the reasons why uh, the central banking system, how things will play and how fast it will play, nobody can really understand it because on top of that, there's multiple, it's a multiplayer system on top of a nonlinear rules set with uh, exponential elements and logarithmic like, elements into it. So there's just uh, no way. But uh, just like, uh, again, coming back to the article from Bill Alter, you know, uh, there's so much fate, misplaced faith in the system right now that uh, it'll be obvious to anyone in 10, 20, 30 years or our children, or children, children, looking back it's like why they didn't see that you know it's, it's, there they'll be freaking obvious then of how sick the system was and how unstable and how about things we were about to but uh again it's a matter of uh, non-linearity and mm. so phil uh before we wrap up uh, let's just zoom out a little bit and i want to have you take like what do you where do you see like geopolitically in terms of mass adoption other countries like you know all of a sudden putting their bitcoin on the on, on their you know reserve as a reserve asset and uh countries like el salvador you know following mm -hmm. uh in the footsteps <laughs> yeah. do you see like an like a sudden unexpected uh like process here taking place or where do you where do you see this going where do you see bitcoin going yeah, I think uh, it's exactly what you're talking about. I mean, I expected in 2015, 2016, I was talking to people and it says, I expect at some point a country to announce it's going to start using Bitcoin as a as their reserve, as part of their reserve. I, I mean, imagine that they'll have gold, uh, they'll have the US dollar, and they'll have Bitcoin. 
and um, <clears throat> that eventually will you know, flow that way. Now, El Salvador has not said that the country itself has accumulated Bitcoin as a reserve. No, exactly. I, I expect they do have U.S. dollars because they they use the U.S. dollars as their currency. So it's it's a given they also have um, the dollar as part of their reserve. Um, and they, I'm, I don't think they have gold. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Maybe they do, but um, not much if they do. Uh, but uh, it'll be very interesting if they start to announce, oh, by the way, we also accumulated uh, Bitcoin as part of our reserve as well as for the country's reserve. Now, typically, that, that aspect is for a country that has a national currency. They will have a reserve. You know, of, uh, now, the fact that they're actually using Bitcoin as well as equal tender implies that they'll, the governments will accept Bitcoin as payment for taxes, property taxes, or you know, government uh, expenses that will be, have to be paid by the, the people. Uh, I mean, they have, they're going to have to, to to imply that uh, it's now it's legal tender. Therefore, they're going to be receiving Bitcoin. Uh, so they'll have as well as, as just as much, um, not as much, but I mean, they'll have Bitcoin as well as dollars uh, in their portfolio. And what other countries is going to do this? Um, yeah, um, I expect this to continue. And that what will be interesting is to see at what point uh, another country that has its own national currency uh, accepting Bitcoin, either having Bitcoin as their reserve currency or backing their national currency with Bitcoin or accepting it as, uh, as another liquid tender. Uh, so that is going to be another angle to the story because uh, it's the very first thing that we see with uh, El Salvador. Um, but it, the, they're using U.S. dollars. So it's, uh, I mean, we might see a, uh, I mean, I, I don't know how many countries are using U.S. dollars as their currency. Yeah. Um, I know Panama is doing, uh, doing, using that. I, I, I forgot how many of, uh, but there's, you know, there's a few. Yeah. And so they might be the first candidate, but uh but crossing the bridge to a country that has its own national currency, uh, then it opens the door for the entire world. Do you see like, uh, you know, I'm a huge fan of Jeff Booth's book also, you know, The Price of Tomorrow, Why Deflation is the Key to an Abundant Future. Have you read his book like about technolo technology, deflation, uh, that's the key, you know, to abundance? No, I haven't read that book. But uh, yeah, deflation uh, means that uh, savers are rewarded instead of penalized. Uh, that's yeah. pretty much and then, yeah you know you pay less and less for better and more products and services and for you know yeah. technological innovation and <clears throat> well by delaying i always say that by delaying your consumption uh, -huh. uh you're allowing somebody else to use those resources exactly yeah whether it's a carpenter uh because you no know, there's um sorry because a, a carpenter has a specific amount of, you know, I, uh, there's only 24 hours in a day. And there's so, so many carpenters or plumbers uh, in a given environment that has competent, comp the competency. So you're, if you're delaying it, then you're allowing somebody else to use those resources. And that's, that's key. And um, okay. that is uh a good way to be rewarded for those things because then eventually you know, by pushing that long, longer down the road then uh, you benefit from the gains that has brought up by others and speculation is now very reduced only very vi viable projects rather than doing everything money is cheap lending is so cheap interest rates so cheap we can speculate anything uh, it's much easier when when the rent on money is so ridiculously right. low and this and is what's so, so sick it's, in the system the cantillion effect you know and the zero or negative interest rate uh, credits uh, being given you know to the same structure yeah. always you yeah. know it'd be you know, governmental structures corporations and this is why we have you know so many you know real yeah. symptoms in in our system yeah and and there's something I, I need to share that with you. I had a conversation with someone. Uh, so typically when I talk to somewhere like a software engineer or something like that, someone who does not have a financial background and I told them about fractional reserve banking, they won't believe me. 
He said, well, you're, t- you're, you're lying. It's like, you're, if you're wrong, and it's like, you're what? You're telling me that when I put uh, $10,000 in the bank account, the bank can turn around and then lend $9,000. And then even though if tomorrow I could make a check for $10,000 to somebody else, uh, and then that $9,000 will still be there. And that $9,000 will be deposited. There will be another $8,000 out of it. Yeah. <laughs> and if you pay off, then it destroys that amount and all no way and all that. Well, I talked to a financial guy who's been uh, educated in the financial system. Yeah, and it's good. And it's actually, this is what it is. I mean, uh, having something where there's no fractional reserve banking, it will be choking the economy. It's not going to allow it. And that's what they've been thought you know it's like we're yeah. going to be Brainwash. struggling or it's not going to be any projects and all that and then my point is well with a fractional reserve banking what you have is that you have got booms and bust and booms and bust and booms and bust and on the average you know on the average you've got the same amount of resource consumed as if you do not have fractional reserve banking and mm-hmm. things are stable like this, you've got the same result, the same amount of resources being taken, as the, as a, but you don't have the impact, the bankruptcies and the destructions of exactly. families and destruction yeah. of everything yeah. that comes with those booms and busts. You just have the flow, a constant flow that is mitigated by the f- supply, the actual supply of, uh, of the elements and, and resources. Yeah. And, you know, and through Bitcoin, you know, and through all these, you know, books and articles and podcasts, there are, I think there is more now, let's just say a more, uh, people are more receptive, you know, they're, they're feeling the pain, the financial pain, they're seeing, you know, prices are rising. So they're more open minded to, you know, to a paradigm shift. It's really a paradigm shift because people, even in universities or schools or wherever through media have been so brainwashed or indoctrinated (laughs) with Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, lies and, and, you know, the consumer price index, all these, you know, things that you mentioned also in the beginning, um, it doesn't make sense. It just doesn't, you know, it's logical. Yeah. I think that's one of the major additional benefit is the education that it brought yeah. Bitcoin, the creation. I mean, if Bitcoin was went to zero tomorrow or something like that, and because it was cracked down by banks and uh, governments and all, and the benefit of it, at least, is how much education it had brought up to uh, everyone. It is just amazing uh, waking up so many people to another alternative away by this experiment and it just showed uh, look at that there's another way to do things oh wow okay you know and it uh it, it's really beautiful and that and it reminds me of uh congressman ron paul which i was a big fan of yeah uh, i'm not sure if you're familiar with uh, okay oh. yes of course yeah of course he was okay. in that the- uh I, it's uh yes so it's just uh fantastic as even though they've made sure they never had any chances of being, you know, they were just brushing him off and putting him aside and making sure nobody t- uh, even saw him, you know. Um, even though that, I mean, the, the fact that he has his presence in, uh, in debate and he was bringing up those points and uh, it was just beautiful as a, for just from that perspective of uh, educating a bunch of people that actually, they got woke up. They realized how things could be, you know, done much better in uh, uh in with uh without not as much government intervention. And that's pretty much what I see that the one of the major benefits of Bitcoin, just at least on the education side. Yeah. On the fundamental you know, libertarians or the Austin economists and uh you know, the gold bugs. I mean, we, we have sort of the, these commonalities, you know, <laughs> and I think maybe we should, uh, you know, try to uh, bundle those forces or, or, or uh, uh, intellects and, and, and knowledge and, and, you know, try to, uh, because, yeah, you know, why, why shouldn't gold coexist with Bitcoin? You know, I mean, peace. Yeah. It's, it's a free yeah. market. And if there's a free, yeah. market, a free market, where people eventually, it will, you know, whatever you call it, converge it to a shelling point and, you know, it will all converge eventually. I mean, from my perspective, all to Bitcoin because it has all the monetary properties we could have ever dreamt of, you know, I uh-huh. mean, every property we can think of, you know, whether it be fungibility, portability, uh, <laughs> I mean, everything yeah. you can think of, unconfiscability. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, Definitely more than gold on the yeah. confis- on confiscability. 
I mean, that's the uh, the one point that uh, you know uh, dogs have to rely. I mean, people in uh, people that are in uh, uh, Venezuela who uh, has a pile of uh, gold and wants to okay, I want to move out of Venezuela because it's awful. It's not going to be unless he's uh, smuggling it out of the country. He's not going to get out of the country with his gold. You know. Yeah. But Bitcoin, uh, uh, Bitcoin, uh, what's that? <laughs> and you cross, and then you just uh, remember your private keys, and <laughs> and that's it. You know, it's totally different. So you yeah. need. So Phil, um, any final thoughts or anything? I, I should have asked you. Uh, I, I and my listeners, we've learned so much from you right now. I mean, uh, where can people find you? I'm gonna put your book on the, you know, on the show notes. Definitely, the book of Satoshi. Definitely, I mean, you, mm -hmm. you know, a must read. Um, so anything you want to, you know, uh, leave my listeners with? Uh, yeah, well, uh, my website is, uh, well, reninvestment.com, and um, which I'm, I'm in the process of uh, updating, actually. Um, and uh, there's bookofsatushi.com, and my Twitter account is egg underscore discambler. And yeah, so that's where they, uh, they can uh, follow mo mostly uh, active on, uh, on Twitter, I, mostly the, uh, the place. And um, I have a newsletter with my reninvestment.com, um, uh, which is uh, going to be, uh, you, know, you know, updated a little bit more. And um, yeah, that's it. Well, wonderful. Really enjoyed our talk. And thank you. Yes, so it was great. Well, hopefully we can repeat this in the future. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so div with development that happens uh, and faster now, so it's very likely. Hey, so how do you like this interview, this talk with Phil Champagne? I really enjoyed this talk. Uh, you know, Satoshi Nakamoto, I think his genius was to connect the dots. Not only, you know, had he uh, special expertise and knowledge in specific fields, whether it be computer science, Austin economics, uh, money, uh, you know, so many other fields, you know, game theory. But um, I think uh, there already, you know, there were already like technologies and understanding knowledge before that, uh, such as you know, Adams bags, hash, cash, and what whatever. So uh, I think his genius was really to connect the dots, to to have a holistic understanding, holistic comprehension, and uh, understand, you know, what it takes, you know, to make uh, unique money, you know, that has all these. You know, monetary properties, technological properties, which has never been, you know, which had never been created before. Uh, would it be, you know, the absolute scarcity, the difficulty adjustment, the proof of work, uh, and all the other monetary properties? So, really, uh, kudos to Field Champagne, who, who really went down the rabbit hole and digged up all these, you know, correspondence materials, communication, and uh, was really fascinating to talk to him about, you know, gold versus Bitcoin. Uh, the monetary system, central banks, uh, the, the mass adoption, the potential mass adoption is going to take place, uh, putting Bitcoin on the on reserve as, as reserve assets by, by different, maybe even smaller countries now. So hope you really enjoyed this. Let me know your questions, your comments, any suggestions for future talks. My email is open. That's kd at kvandavani.com. And uh, make sure you follow Phil Champagne on Twitter. You can follow him on LinkedIn, uh, buy his book, and uh, yeah, give me some feedback. Give him a feedback. And if you can, write a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or iTunes. That would really bump up, you know, the algorithm. And uh, yeah, thank you so much again, and I'll see you soon. Bye.